Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fearlessly Authentic. I am so excited to have you join me this week. My name is Jody Harrison Bauer, if you didn't get that in the intro. And I'm just so excited about everybody who's been listening to the show and sharing it with their friends. So I urge you to rate, review, and subscribe. I love to hear from you. I love to get messages from you and hear what you've learned from the show, and what you would like to hear more of. So on the show, we talk about love, dating, sex, relationships, business. Today, we are going to be talking about fertility and infertility, and it's going to be an amazing show, and I can't wait to introduce my guest to you. Um, but before we get to my guest, I wanted to share with you something that has changed the way I feel in my body. Um, about a year and a half, I started using Sakara, which is a plant-based company. They offer a bunch of different products, but I started with the meal delivery because I don't like to, go to cook at all. Um, and I thought, well, I have no idea how to cook with plants, so I better have them create the meals for me. So if you are at all interested in going plant-based, but don't know how to create the meals, aren't sure how to make it taste really, really good, try Sakara. that's S-A-K-A-R-A.com, and use my code to get 20% off your first purchase. It's X-O Jody. So 20% off, go to Sakara.com X-O Jody to save 20% on your first purchase. And that is it. So here we go on to the show. I wanted to introduce my beautiful guest to you. I'm so excited. Elizabeth, welcome to the show before I start introducing you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited you're here too. Elizabeth King is a certified fertility health coach, master certified ICF life coach, birth and bereavement doula, and new parent educator. Her mission is to help people of all backgrounds conceive a healthy baby and carry to term. After having three children of her own after the age of 40, Elizabeth believes taking a more holistic approach is the key to success when attempting to conceive. Now she has helped hundreds of women achieve their dreams of conception and parenthood in 20 plus countries around the world. She supports clients through natural fertility, infertility, IVF, miscarriage loss, early pregnancy, PTSD, and new parent support. With over 30,000 followers on Instagram, Elizabeth is the host of the podcast, Pretty Little Tribe. For her expertise, she has been featured on Good Morning, Washington, D.C., ABC, NBC, CBS, and in Parade Magazine and Romper on many podcasts. And she is a contributor to the best-selling book, Naturally Conceived. That's a lot. You've been working a lot to help other women, haven't you? It really is my passion and my mission these days. Yes. I love that. So let's start out how how you got into this field to begin with. I know you you mentioned, I mentioned in your um, bio that you have three children and you conceived after the age of 40. Was that something that you were concerned about? Yeah, definitely. Going into starting to try, I didn't really know what that was going to look like. I had just had a fibroid surgery within the year prior to that. So um, that kind of was this, well, I shouldn't say, let me back up. The real starting point was at age 36, I froze my eggs. And that's really when it kind of opened my eyes to the whole process of IVF and what that meant and how that affects your body, et cetera. Then I went on to live my life and came back at 40, I just had a fibroid surgery that, by the way, my doctor, my regular OB had said that the fibroids were not going to be an issue. And my gut just told me I better go check with a fertility doctor because wow. something didn't seem right. And he said, yes, the, they are small, but the location of them are preventing implantation. So I always tell people, if you have any, you know, twinge in your gut feeling or an intuition that you need to go a step further, do that just so you get the lay of the land and you know what you're dealing with because can i just stop you there for a second the fibroids yeah, that were that your doctor saw or that you mm -hmm. had did you have a gut feeling that something was going on is that why you went to see a doctor well my periods had changed they had always okay. been normal and then out of nowhere they just were super heavy and so it was pretty they did an ultrasound at the ob and they as literally brushed it off like it's not a big deal they're they're small so it's not a problem. 
other than the fact, of course, the heavy bleeding was a problem, but you could live with it. It wasn't debilitating or anything like that. But I just knew from a conception perspective, it wasn't normal. Like it wasn't normal to go from normal, regular periods to all of a sudden, you know, this significant change. Do you think that there's an issue with maybe obstetricians, gynecologists in that? I'd like to speak for a few minutes about that because I've heard that a lot. I've read a lot about that. What, why would an OBGYN kind of brush something off like that? Well, for one, it's not necessarily their specialty Okay. around fertility. So, you know, maybe they needed to be asking me, was I planning on having a baby soon? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, take that conversation a little bit further. To me, women's health in general, whether you're trying to conceive or you are pregnant or whatever, is extremely important. So nothing should be brushed under the rug because who knows what that could potentially turn into later down the road, whether that's, you know, a lump in the breast or cervical issues or whatnot, like everything needs to be addressed and should, in my opinion, of course, never be taken lightly. Um, so I think that's really where the, the difference lies though, especially with the fertility aspect. A fertility doctor, that's what they specialize in. They go to school just for that. The OBs are great when you are pregnant, right? When they're taking care mm. of the, the mother and the baby and they're, you know, measuring that everything's fine, et cetera. Um, but prior to that, I think when it comes to those sorts of situations, really going to a specialist is great. And to go a little further with that, when I had my surgery, my fertility doctor suggested that I see a gynecological oncologist because mm -hmm. of the types of um, robotic surgical equipment that they had that your normal OB probably doesn't have when they do a surgery. And when you're doing any sort of gynecological surgery, you want to make sure that you're not causing more scar tissue or other things to happen when you're looking to, of course, conceive down the road, because that could potentially be the reason that you don't is scar tissue. So, so it sounds like the OB is like the general practitioner of yes. female health. Let's just yes. say that, right? Yes. So from there, we as women need to really be educated about the information that's out there and the availability we have to it. And if not, find somebody who can help you somebody like you. And I never looked at it that way until you were just describing that story. And I just thought that's the broad picture. That's the internist, right? Yes. That then sends you to a specialist, but this doctor that you saw did not send you to a specialist. They just said, just, you know, hang in there with the heavy periods and it's yeah. nothing to worry about, but right. your gut told you, which is so many times women are very intuitive. Don't you think? Absolutely. And they should really trust that intuition and go seek out somebody. So what happened to you after you did seek out a specialist? Yeah, I think most people are think of a fertility doctor or as they're referred to reproductive endocrinologist as this big, scary thing. I'm like, yeah. oh, well, that means I have to do IVF or whatnot. No, right. it's just the special specialist in that area, right? You're not going to go to a orthopedic surgeon to look at something that's not relevant to them. And it's the same type of thing. I always say, just get the lay of the land from a specialist. So you know mm. what you're dealing with. Is everything open and not blocked? You know, is there, everything's clear, everything's good to go. Okay, great. At least, you know, kind of what your starting point is. So from there, I did that surgery and went on to have my first son naturally and delivered him at 41. And it after that first pregnancy, I had my first miscarriage. And that's really what the turning point was mm. for me to realize this whole world of fertility, miscarriage loss, et cetera, where there was really no support at the time. That was um, five years ago, four and a half years ago now. Um, now there's so much, which I'm so happy to report, yes. but at the same time, the people that are going through it still feel quite alone because that overall broad awareness is just, it's not being spoken about. So it's, and I know we're going to get into more detail about that because we've spoken about this in quite a amount of detail. Um, I suffered two consecutive miscarriages, both at around seven and eight weeks. 
And you're right. There wasn't, that was 19... 80, 1991 and 1992, because then my daughter was born in 1993. So 89 mm-hmm. and 93 for me. Yes, they're older. Yes, mm-hmm. I'm older. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was nobody, nobody yeah. I could talk to. It was just, yeah, like a really secretive thing. And why is that? And even the doctors, God bless them, they don't know what to say, right? No. They, they tell you it's not your fault. It's, you know, it's very common. And it's this awkward, I don't know about you, but it's this awkward time where they're looking for a heartbeat and you're like, just oh, stop looking worst. and let me go home, you know, like, just get me out of here. And yeah. um, you kind of like hold, at least for me, it was holding your breath and my husband was there holding his breath too. And it's like, you mm-hmm. just need to get out of the building to take a breath and breathe and then start to mourn the process. But they're not the nursing staff, the doctors, they're not qualified to deal with the emotional aspect that goes along with it. For them, it's just another day at the office. And I can assure you for me, and I don't know for your situation as well, it was life-changing. It was not just another day. Like this happened in 1991 and 92, and it still affects me. You know, whenever I hear about a woman who is trying to get pregnant and has miscarriages, my heart goes out to her because I remember how lonely, even though, you know, my husband at that time was supportive in all family, you know, everybody was supportive. Nobody really understood what to do. And I think the emotional support, like you just mentioned, I, the only emotional support, I never thought about talking to a therapist at the time, Mm -hmm. that probably would have been really helpful, you know, because I didn't want to miscarriage. And the doctor said, you know, we're not sure, but we think you are miscarrying. And I was like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, we can do the procedure. We could abort the pregnancy because we think you're going to miscarry anyway. And I said, no, I want to miscarry on my own. Mm -hmm. That's a horrible feeling too. So the second time I said, okay, I know what this is. I cannot go through this emotional trauma again. And I was scared of ever conceiving again. So, so fearful. Like here it is. 29 years later, 30, 31 years later, and it's still so emotional. So do you help women get through this time in their life? Yeah, there's so many different aspects that go into it. Um, Going through pregnancy after loss, right? You carry that PTSD of, is the other shoe going to drop? Is there going to be a heartbeat when I go? Is the baby growing on time? Um, the, how you move through the world with this grief of most of the time, not knowing why it happened. So you fear, is there something wrong with me? Am I broken? Am I not woman enough to have a baby or carry them to term or whatnot? And then there's the aspect of the relationship standpoint. I mean, I know for my husband, it was just, he wanted it to be better for me. He wanted me to feel happy again and normal again, and just, you know, Move, not move on, but he, he didn't know how to support me through that. Right. And I actually did seek out a therapist that specialized in miscarriage loss after my first. And I'll never forget, I walked out of there more hysterical than I did going in as my husband was waiting in the car for me. And because I, she didn't communicate that she knew what I was feeling, mm-hmm. right? So that she had which is common for most therapists that they have this boundary of not to cross this line of, I understand what you're feeling. I've been through this before. I also have children now, you know, I was looking for somebody who just understood what I was going through and to tell me it was going to be okay. And to tell me that, you know, you'll get through this and right now you feel like your world is devastated, but you will move, move on and move forward. Like almost authentic, authentic empathy, right? Yes. yeah. Yeah. And I just felt like I donated some money to her for that hour and I just felt like nothing was returned to me and that felt worse to me. I just wanted someone like um, someone emotionally to hold me in that time and right. I definitely didn't get that. So that's what I try to show up for women now today with this bereavement doula aspect of that, whether that's an early miscarriage or you know, up to... I mean, it, the technical terms differ, but stillbirth, et cetera, um, or late term losses, whether that's for genetic issues or whatnot, because um, obviously very traumatic. And then you're you're never the same going into a pregnancy after you've had a loss. 
Like it's impossible to move forward with, you know, a fresh kind of nonchalant excitement when you're pregnant again after you've had a loss because it's always there in the back of your mind. So we just work through different tools and it's different for everybody to help them manage to find the joy and to find the excitement and just the the release of knowing that each time is different. And just because you've had this experience does not necessarily mean that it's going to happen again. We also help them to navigate through recurring loss panels or other tests that they can advocate for themselves to have their doctors run so that they don't have to wait for three losses in order to get this information. Um, because you know, for me, knowledge is power. If you if you know you have a blood clotting disorder and that's what's causing it, well, let's find that out after number one and not after number three, um, because there's so many ways that we can help to prevent those if we know really what's going on. Where were you when I needed you, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing what you do to help women. So one of the things that I know when anybody goes into therapy for anything is they have, you know, an anxiety, a fear or whatever it is. So do you provide them with tools to manage these feelings so they can, because, you know, if we're anxious or fearful, more than likely, we're not going to conceive, right? Mm -hmm. Like our bodies and our minds need to be aligned in a really, really good place. And I know that right away, I want to get pregnant again. And then when I thought about it, I started crying and I'm like, I'm not in a good place. I can't do this. Um, and then it happened again. I'm like, well, I just need to take a total break, but I, I could have really used the tools rather than being completely obsessive, compulsive with everything that I did. So mm -hmm. what kind of tools do you provide? Yes. I mean, it's so common, Jody. I think at any time, you know, for when you, you went through it to, to now as well, I think first and foremost, it's really allowing yourself to grieve a death. It's, you're grieving the story of what you thought your life was going to be. From the moment that you get that positive pregnancy test, you have this idea in your head of what your life is going to be like. What car am I going to drive that's going to have a car seat in it? What yes. house are we going to live in? When is the baby due? Is it a winter baby? Is it a summer baby? Whatever. So you're grieving the story of the idea of what your life is going to be like that's suddenly ripped from under you which is very different than grieving somebody who you knew in your life that, you know, maybe they were in a car accident or they were ill for a long time. At least you have a reason as to why that happened. Um, usually with a miscarriage loss, you don't get the reasoning behind it. So it's trying to make sense of a situation that most of the time doesn't make sense. And because you're the carrier of this baby, you tend to blame yourself. So a lot of that healing right out the gate needs to go from having a remembrance ceremony, whether that's just with yourself or your husband or your partner. Love that. As well as you and I talked about before, if that's planting a tree or a flower that blooms, you know, once a year or whatnot, or a piece of jewelry, I that's how I chose to remember my losses. It's just something that you are honoring that time and space in your life that really affected you and you were grieving in that and really give yourself the time to grieve that as a proper loss. As I mentioned before, when we spoke that India is the only country in the world that actually gives off um, bereavement, um, bereavement time off from your job based on miscarriage at any time of your miscarriage, because they understand the significance from a mental, emotional, and physical standpoint. So laws are trying to change in other countries as well, but um, usually it's, you know, maybe after 24 week of loss, but nothing on an early stage. So I think starting with just that remembrance ceremony, first of all, and then, you know, writing or journal, like journal writing or right. meditation or whatever it is for you that you feel gets you to a healing place in order to feel like, okay, I've, I've cried as much as I can. I've processed this as much as I can. I've done the the physical work as much as I can, right? I always say like, get the answers that you can if there, if it's possible. So if there's a DNC tissue, have it tested. So, you know, you know, is there something there? Was it genetic? I did not do that. I did right. not do that. Yeah. So at least, you know, again, what you're dealing with. If it's, if it's chromosomal, like all mine were, 
it's different when you it's chromosomal there's nothing you can do about it but at least i knew it wasn't a genetic issue right, right. it wasn't like right. some sort of some problem like in that way that was causing right. it or i didn't have a blood clotting disorder and whatnot so I, I do always say we want to do our due diligence from the medical side as well but also healing from the emotional standpoint really does regulate your nervous system and get your cortisol levels back into you know a balanced place as you were mentioning that's where we need to be in order to conceive again and let our body know it's safe because our mind is thinking just gave me goosebumps. You just yeah. completely gave me goosebumps, right? It's safe for us to conceive. That was my biggest fear is that I'm yeah. um, right. Because yeah. we think we can't trust ourselves at that point, right? Yes. We think that our body is not safe. And in fact it is, and we just need to, you know, figure out and help it along. And so oftentimes I coach people through, we, Talk to your body as its own entity and yourself mm -hmm. as its own almost. So it's two separate things. You're thanking your body. You're sending gratitude and love to your body for all that it's doing. And it's, you know, it's ovulating for you. It's walking for you. You know, you have the ability to move throughout your life. So even gratitude for the simple things helps us to get out of the state of anxiety and or lack or fear that something else may be happening. So again, every the tools for everybody are different, but they also can be super easy. So it's about finding what sparks joy for you and what you right. love. So if writing isn't for you or meditation isn't for you, maybe baking or cooking is for you, right? So looking up um, recipes on Pinterest of what you can create, it's all about, we wanna create a human life. So throughout your day, having that intention of what can I create? I'm gonna create, a coloring that. book. I'm going to dance and have creation be our movement be my creation today. I'm going to, you know, I have people that are like, I created a spreadsheet today. Great. <laughs> because the intention was there, right? Creation. So as long as you're have that intention that you're constantly creating in your day and your body is capable of doing this, um, it starts to shift the biology of your body to know that it is safe and it is okay. And the reality is, is one in four that we know of go through a miscarriage loss. So I wasn't aware of that when I had mine. I really thought like I was the only person on the planet that was going right. through this. But I always say again, with this and fertility, if you're in a Starbucks line and you see one in four is being affected by miscarriage loss, one in eight is affected by fertility. That's a pretty significant number of people suffering through either of these things that we really don't talk about quite honestly. No. Um, and I wonder if the, in the infertility rate, has that increased over years? Have miscarriages increased over the years? So the miscarriage rate has stayed pretty consistent. Although again, it's people say that it's under reported because a lot of people have chemical pregnancies or mm. blighted ovums and things where sometimes they don't even realize that they were pregnant and they've, they were, but they lost it. Um, the infertility rate though, has been on a six year decline globally. Mm. Um, and so unfortunately I don't see that that's going to be shifting anytime soon, but yeah, that number has been going that direction, unfortunately. So after you had your miscarriage, did you did the research, you took care of yourself, you did the things that you're now teaching other women to do. And that's when that sparked you, you realize I need to learn more about this so I can help other women, empower women with that knowledge. As you said, we all know knowledge is power. So if you could educate these women, empower them, and then inspire them. Yeah. Then it was, it was literally in the moment of me having the DNC, I was sitting or laying in the bed in the clinic, the bed next to me had a drape in between. So it was probably four feet between my husband and I, and this other couple, we were doing the DNC and they were doing their first round of IVF. So they were so wow. excited and having this conversation and we could hear it. And I genuinely, I get goosebumps to this day. I genuinely, genuinely was excited for them, but I was so torn apart myself. And that's when I knew it was time for me to shift my life coaching to do fertility coaching. So you just focus specifically on fertility now? Yes. Yeah. I think there needs to be more people like you doing things like this. I, well, that's the goal is yeah. to get 
the more people that we talk to and educate and bring awareness to this, then I just kind of imagine it like a domino effect, right? And people worldwide will know that they're not alone and there's, you know, there's hope and there's somebody to lean on. There's somebody that's there to support them and serve them. And they don't need to kind of flail through this new education, new language, all of these things that come along with miscarriage loss and or fertility on their own. Like there's a lot of people that are there to help now. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much information that we still need to go through, but you now have three children, as we said at the beginning. So after your miscarriage, you had how much, how long was it before you conceived and and had your next child? I don't need like nitty gritty information there for the conception. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, I'm horrible at dates and timing and everything. What I do know is I had three boys within three years. So so it was as much as it felt, you know, like a long time in between and with the losses in between, it was fairly quick. So um, I had the one loss, had my second baby, had another loss, third baby, and then that was it. So um, I think when you're in it though, and you feel that, especially when you're at an older age. So again, at this point I was over, well, I delivered my first baby at 41. So, um, 42 and a half, let's say with number two, you don't, you think that you don't have the time to grieve properly as well with these losses. It's like, okay, I got to like, hurry hurry up, up, hurry up. Let's go. Let's go. Right. And that's when we started having conversations about, do I use these frozen eggs that I have from age 36? Mm. Do we start to do IVF? Like how long do we try to conceive naturally before we go a different route? And I was lucky because that uh, reproductive endocrinologist was still following me because I had had this relationship with him through my myomectomy, which was the uh, fibroid surgery, my first son, and then the second loss, et cetera. So I was always very in tune with my body and being tracked by this fertility doctor. So it was always a constant conversation of what's the plan? What do we do next? And that's where I start with my fertility clients, because I think when a lot of us are type A, we want to know what the plan is and having Mm -hmm. that plan again, regulates your nervous system. When your service system is regulated and your cortisol levels can be intact, you feel like you can achieve something and you know what your plan is. And I find that that's the biggest thing with um, my fertility clients is that just knowing what's plan B and plan C, and that can change at any time, right? So if you say, I, you know, I don't really want to go down the road of IVF, I'm going to do IUI instead, but then after one IUI, you change your mind. Great. Nobody's judging you in that and everybody is supporting you. So it's all good. Yeah. I mean, again, it's the support and the education of like, this is what we're going to try. And then we're going to go from there, but I'm right here. I'm right here with you. So I want to get into this after the break. We're going to take a short break. Everybody stay with us with Elizabeth King. We will be back in a few minutes. Yay. Welcome back everybody to Fearlessly Authentic. My guest today is Elizabeth King, and we are talking about how she helps women navigate through infertility, miscarriages. What else, Elizabeth? Because I know I, I, the list goes on and on. You're better to describe it. Well, and preparing them for when their baby comes to have that confidence um, and carrying them through those first really six months of newborn life and everything. So it, it kind of evolves from preconception all the way to I kind of fade out once their baby's around six months old. So wow. it's a full experience with everyone, which is so beautiful. And I'm so honored to be part of that. It is beautiful because, you know, what I do for a living is help women feel strong and confident in their bodies. And when I see them get to the point where they have success, where they've reached their quote unquote goal, where they think that's their goal. And then I see them just go live their life. Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, there, I gave you your wings. Now go fly my child. It's it's a beautiful thing. It really, really is. is. Um, So we were talking a lot about miscarriages and, but what happens after a few miscarriages or somebody who just can't get pregnant? Um, how do you help them? I mean, the amazing thing is now, if you are wanting to be a parent, there are so many options to to go through now. You can have 
egg donation, you can do sperm donation, you can have embryo adoption, you can go regular adoption, um, surrogacy. There's, I mean, it's endless, really. It's so amazing that technology that we have around fertility these days, and it's continuing to get better and better all the time. Um, so I think the the main thing is don't give up hope if that's really your dream to build your family. Yeah. And most people think, oh, I can't afford to do IVF or I can't afford to do surrogacy. There are so many resources now as well that do grants and loans specific for fertility and IVF and surrogacy and all of those things. So yeah. um, there's really look into that and, and don't kind of shut the door on that because I know even when I started doing this process four or five years ago, I remember thinking the same thing. My insurance didn't cover IVF or anything for fertility for that matter. And the thought of that was like, well, that's just not going to be an option for me. Right. And really, there are so many options now. You just have to do a little digging to get there. When would you suggest a woman starts freezing her eggs? And what is the difference between freezing her eggs and or embryo? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's pretty common now for people to say, you freeze your eggs, freeze your eggs. Um, and I would agree with that because it almost ends up being an insurance policy, so to speak. However, mm -hmm. it's one that we can't guarantee. You kind of go into it thinking, I'm going to do this, but there's a potential that there's it may not work when I need it as well. I get back to the technology, it's much better than it used to be. So now there's about a five to 15% delta in whether a embryo thaws well versus an egg thawing well. So for example, when I did it, which was about, I don't know, 10 years ago now, the it, you were much better off to freeze an embryo versus freezing an egg because an egg in and of itself, the biology of that, the molecular structure of an egg doesn't thaw well. It's more water-based versus an embryo, which is a sperm and an egg together, the consistency of that changes. So the thawing, the statistically of that thawing better is is much better. I guess mince my words there a little bit, but no, I understand what you're saying. You just yeah. it's more quality, like it just more sustainable, maybe. Yeah, it's stronger. It has stronger. more structure to it than an egg that's based more on water, quite frankly. Um, but now there's only it's only really a five to fifteen percent difference on whether you're thawing an egg versus thawing an embryo. So what my ideal situation to people that are single and they're thinking they're gonna right. freeze eggs would be let's say in an ideal world you get ten eggs extracted, let's freeze five just on their own in hopes that you meet the love of your life and you get to have those to use. And in the event that you don't and you decide you want to be a parent on your own, or maybe it's much later and your those eggs don't thaw well, you have five frozen embryos as well from a sperm donor um, so that you have almost a backup plan mm -hmm. if that doesn't go well or something you know shifts in your life that wasn't as planned, then at least you have the embryos as an option to use later because I have many, many clients that are in their late forties that they can't even use their own eggs at this point. So mm -hmm. had they frozen embryos way back when in their thirties and or early forties, which most clinics won't do anymore, but, um, you would still have something that would be biologically yours at that point. So if you're a single woman, 30 to 30, 40, you should think about freezing your eggs if you're like on this trajectory in your job or you just don't see yourself finding Mr. or Mrs. Wonderful or whoever it is. When is the age where you should say, you know, I'm not really sure what my life looks like in 10 years. I think I should freeze my eggs. Or I mean, I, ideally, I would say not past 35. Okay. Because we do know that, you know, your 40 year old eggs are 40 years old, et cetera. However, we are taking care of our bodies better now than we ever have before from right. a, you know, supplement standpoint, exercise, diet, et cetera. But the reality is, you know, your age is your age. And that might not always match you chronologically and biologically, but at the same time, it's better to be safer than sorry. And they, 
we know that that fertility myth cliff of the 35 your your fertility really drops off that's not really the case anymore there's a lot of studies recently that have come out to say that that's not necessarily so but in any event we're still better off with younger cells i mean you can look you know i look at my face from 25 to 45 and there's a big difference it's, oh yeah it's the cells right it's yes, no different absolutely. it's made out of cells that are in your body so and stay out of the sun but yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah totally so that's what i would that would be my recommendation for somebody that age and it also takes the pressure off of you know i need to hurry up and meet somebody because i want right. to have a baby that's off the table because you know that you have this backup plan and that elim eliminates this pressure of feeling like you know, you're under this biological clock, so to speak. And yes, you are in some ways, but it's not as heavy as it would be if you, you know, normally were. So, and a lot of um, companies are offering insurance packages now that do cover fertility. So if you're ever kind of looking for a new job and you're in your early oh, 20s, mid 30s, I recommend checking out that just kind of take a sneaky peek to see what it is because it might be something that would be helpful for you to look into. Well, there's the little truth about all those moms out there, like my mom and my grandmother, who's like, hurry up, Jody, hurry up, got to get married, get right. out those babies. And, you know, I, I was married at 24 and had my first daughter at 28. And then when I had the two miscarriages, that pushed me out to 32. And I thought, oh, I'm so old. But you know what? As you're speaking, 25 to 35 is prime time to, yeah. to you know, make a baby. So yeah. if you're out there and, and you're not looking to have a child soon, yes, please listen to Elizabeth. So where can they go, Elizabeth, to, to do this, have this procedure? And is everybody um, a good candidate for it? You would want to find a fertility clinic to speak to, and they would, they do all the genetic carrier testing out the gate to make sure that you are okay to be doing this and whatnot. Um, for most people, they're fine to do it. And it's actually much, much easier than people expect it to be to, to go through IVF. Mm -hmm. Um, the real stress of it honestly is the, the waiting games of finding out your results and whatnot, the needles and all of that is really if I can do it on my own, anybody can do it. Wow. <laughs> so um, that part is the easy part. The attrition with IVF in general is really the emotional roller coaster. So it's the one situation that I can only think of where you may have 10 eggs retrieved and then only end up with one or no embryos based on wow. how that all goes down. And that's really where you need support in going through this. The Mayo Clinic did a study in 2013 around people that were going through infertility are experiencing the same level of stress as a cancer patient. And part of that is just the emotional drain and the ups and downs that go along with this anticipation of not knowing what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, if you're capable of doing it, and financially, on your relationship, all the things that go into um dealing with a situation with infertility. And again, taking care of your mind, because as you spoke about earlier, if you are not in a good place mindfully, that is going to affect you. That yeah. will, I mean, it's all about the attitude, having mm -hmm. gratitude. I know for me and for you, because we had a child, then we had a miscarriage. For me, I put all of my heart and soul and I wasn't creating anything except for creating like a beautiful relationship with my daughter, you know, because I was yeah. so grateful. I was like, yeah. she may be the only child I ever conceive. Were you like that at all? And just was like, oh my goodness, I'm just going to hug this kid forever. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you, then that also actually comes on with other issues as well sometimes though, because you feel like, right. you know, am I, I, do I feel guilty because I'm not with them all the time and all those right. sorts of things, oh, you yeah. know, and, or I'm not allowed to get frustrated with my baby, not sleeping through the night because what if, and you know, you are allowed to get frustrated. You yes. are allowed to get upset. Yes. It is hard yes. to be a new parent, but yes, a hundred percent. I always, you never knew if this was the last time. I mean, I remember going to see a, a second opinion on one of the fertility doctors and he didn't even look at my history. He just looked at my age and said, you need to do an egg donor. And I just felt like, I don't think so. I just had a baby. I don't right. think that's my issue. Um, 
but oftentimes the clinics are worried about their statistics of um, what comes out of their office. So therefore looking at somebody who's 42, almost 43, and or maybe I was 43 at the time, I'm not an ideal candidate for them to have a success story out of their right. clinic. So you really wanna find somebody who's on board with your journey and not willing to give up with you and who's part of your fertility team. And that's where a fertility coach comes into to offer you different suggestions of who you can talk to and what route to go and who to, you know, I always say like decline that invite of this person that put this in your head because right. the mindset, again, once we get something there, it's hard to undo that. Anybody who's listening right now, like, please get in touch with, with Elizabeth. If you are having any of these issues, we'll give all the information at the end of the show, how they can get in touch with you. I really wish you were around when I was going through all of this stuff. So let's talk about male infertility, something that most people don't even know about or discuss. Yeah, male factor infertility is a big conversation these days, which I'm happy to note because it's taking a little pressure off the female, always thinking, again, that blanket statement that most doctors would say was, oh, your egg quality, your egg quality, your egg quality. Well, now mm -hmm. we also know it's sperm quality too. So it's in one sense, again, taking that pressure off, but on the other side, it's opening this new world for men to be more in touch with their fertility to realize we don't just take this for granted. It is super common. And the benefit usually most of the time with most men, male factor infertility, it can be reversed. So they can take supplements and you can see a difference. Wow. Whereas for females, we can take all the supplements and do all the things knowing that we have the ability to affect change every 120 to 150 days with our eggs based on our lifestyle, diet, exercise, and supplements. With males, but we never see the result of that, like un to know. With males, right, right. they can measure at you know day one, take all their supplements, change their lifestyle, their stress, maybe stop smoking, drinking, all these things, test again in 75 days, 72 days, and we'll see the difference of what has come out. I'm such a numbers person and a data person. I love that wow. because I have seen so many times people who have low sperm counts or motility issues or whatnot, and they make these changes and they really can improve, which is so great. But the point in saying this is we don't ever want to assume that it's just the woman. Right. And so when you do get that baseline from a reproductive endocrinologist or a reproductive um, urologist in the case for what we would want the males to go to, um, it's really important just to get a baseline from them too, because you don't want to be spinning your wheels for two years thinking that you're the problem and trying to conceive when all along it's the male factor infertility. So do yourself a favor for both you and your partner and get checked at the same time so you know what's happening. Exactly. Or get checked before, I mean, it's almost the same thing with women. Now, does it decline as they get older like women do? It does. It, okay. We right. think that it doesn't because we've seen like Hugh Hefner and all these people have <laughs> right. babies at like 90. Um, right. But actually the sperm quality does start to get affected over the age of 40 for men. Okay. So it just affects them a little bit older. Yeah. And so you, we were talking also about coaching people who are already coaches who are involved with women, like somebody like me who can yeah. coach other women. Can you explain, you do this, you help other coaches coach women. Can you explain that to us? Yes. I run the Fertility Coach Academy where we take other women who are in some sort of industry where they, or not even actually for that matter, stay at home moms and nurses and all kinds of women, um, but personal trainers, midwives, doulas, people that they're in the world of talking and having conversations around women and their cycles and what's happening and just wanting to take that a step further to be able to have more education around fertility specifically, as well as coaching specifically of how do I handle women and or men for that matter that are going through infertility and this very delicate stage of their life to help them get to the other side and building the family that they've always wanted. So if it's something that you feel like you're having conversations normally, on. I, in fact, I had one hairdresser reach out to me because she's like, I have my clients tell me all the time about um, their periods and what's happening and, you know, whatever. And so she just started to get more and more intrigued about this. And she had had a su successful 
pregnancies herself. So she felt like she wanted to pay it forward essentially and switch um, her, her career in doing that. So I think if you have any sort of inclination towards women's health and or fertility specifically, again, it's the domino effect. The more people that are out there that are serving this one in eight women in America that need the help and one in four that are going through miscarriage, the better off we'll all be as a collective for women globally to know that we're not alone and there's so much help out there. No, women need to understand they're not alone. It's women empowering women, women supporting other women. Like we need to all be there for each other. And sometimes we just um, isolate ourselves and feel that there is nobody out there. We're the only ones suffering. And I'm here to say, Elizabeth is here to say, you are not alone. Reach out to Elizabeth and um, let her help you. So if you were to name like the top three, four things that, a woman should look out for, or um, let's say, do in order to like be proactive. So if somebody wants to get pregnant, no matter what her age is, yeah. or maybe it, it should be a different age, what can she do to make sure she's in the best physical and mental form in order to conceive that child? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think first and foremost, what your point about what what age, I really think, you know, we're not taught this in school. We're taught about like maybe your periods every 28 days, which most people is not. Um, We don't know about ovulation. So I think having those conversations with your daughters, granddaughters, sisters, that are of the age of their cycle to just know this is how the full cycle works. There's four parts to the cycle. Most people don't know that. And understanding what your body is doing during that time. You know, it's when is the time to push your body with working out versus when is it to slow down based on your cycle? Totally. Most people think I'm just gonna, you know, I'm working out all the time and hitting it hard all the time. You can't do that to your body when it's trying to function in a reproductive time in the month. And there is Um, a reason why men wake up with a heart on, let's just put it that way, (laughs) ready to go. And and they're at the gym at 530 because they're building testosterone at that time. We're not doing that. That's why you don't, I think that's why you don't see a lot of women working out at 530 in the morning. That's maybe not our most productive time. I'm generally speaking. Yeah. But also really even dialing that in further as to where you are in your cycle. Are you day one through 15 where you're building up your estrogen? Are you day 15 through 28 where your progesterone is, you know, working harder? Um, So educating the people that are around you to know there's more to the story than what we know of and and think that there is. tracking your cycles, knowing when, when is your cycle happening? When do you really ovulate? Most people don't ovulate on day 14, which is this myth that everybody thinks that that is the case. Right. That changes based on how long your period is and whatnot. So just having a good idea, you know, a year before you're trying to conceive as to, okay, what is my cycle? What's my body rhythm? What's happening during these times? Taking notes in your phone when you're you know, do I get headaches right before I start my period? That's usually a sign that something's off hormonally. Do I have acne? Um, do I have heavy cramping? Is my period too light or too heavy? Um, all those sorts of things are the things that you want to watch out for before you're trying to conceive. But most importantly is, are you ovulating? When do you ovulate? And making sure that you understand how that whole process works so that you can time it right when you are trying to actually conceive. And if you're not trying to conceive, time it right as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So Elizabeth, I have two questions for you before yes. we end. We only have three minutes left. Okay. I can't believe it. Went by covered. so fast. Yes, it did. So um, first, how can everyone reach you? Best way to reach you. Um, Best way to reach me is on Instagram, Elizabeth King underscore coaching, my podcast, Pretty Little Tribe, or my website, ElizabethKing.com. Okay, great. Thank you. And what does it mean to you to live a fearlessly authentic life? Well, you said it earlier, empowered women empower women. It really is my goal every day to help someone else, whether that's a woman or a man, but most of the time for what I do, it's other women. And it for me that's been a big shift in my life i've had another business for over 20 years that was 
in software marketing, which was, you know, so far from women's wellness. And now I see the impact of living a heart led life and helping others and empowering others and what a difference that can make in their lives and seeing the joy in somebody else and how that ripples back to myself. So that's what I think. I love that. I love that. I don't think that women understand that when you do something like you do, how much joy it brings to you. And that's how you probably know that you are doing what you're meant to be doing, right? Yes. A hundred percent. When you get the the text messages of the ultrasound pictures or the new babies that are born or whatnot, it's, it really is. You, you cannot wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> um. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Elizabeth King. Again, you can go also um, to her bio, which I will have upload. It will be uploaded on the podcast and on Voice America. Um, I am just so grateful that you were here today and that we connected like this and that you have educated everybody so much. This is crucially important information for women as women are you know, having children later in life. So thank you so much because- here on Fearlessly Authentic, every week we want to educate, empower, and inspire you so you live a fearlessly authentic life. So thank you so much. And until next week, everybody, go live a fearlessly authentic life. Bye. Bye. Thank you.